we all have evolved abilities to try and control other people. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kisson. And this is a show for you if you're bored with people arguing on the internet over subjects they know nothing about. At Trigonometry, we don't pretend to be the experts, we ask the experts. Our brilliant guest this week is one of our favorite ever guests and favorite ever human beings on the planet. She's an evolutionary psychologist, Dr. Diana Fleischman. Welcome back to Trigonometry. Hi, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, we buttered you up with that intro. I, was, I feel so happy and warm now. <laughs> but you genuinely were. I mean, if you haven't seen our f first interview with Diana, go back and watch it. It is absolutely brilliant. It was quite early in the day for the show, and you, genuinely, it was a, gr a great pleasure. I had a which really is good why time. we're delighted to have you back. Yeah. Uh, which is why it pains me to ask the first question that I'm going to ask, which is. I've met some people recently uh, who I told that I do the show who I hadn't seen for many years. And I mentioned that we've had some evolutionary psychologists on. And the reaction that I got was literally like I'd advocated for a resurgence of the Third Reich. So why is it that evolutionary psychology has a bad rap? Because the argument that particular person was making, it's all about reinforcing gender stereotypes. It's all about getting women back in the kitchen where they belong. Getting women back in the kitchen barefoot <laughs> yeah. pregnant. and pregnant where they belong. So I do think that people have this impression that evolutionary psychology is reactionary because it says that many of the gender roles and the patterns that you see cross-culturally, especially between men and women, are a natural state of affairs. So they would say, potentially, that some sex roles, like things that women are more nurturing and that men seek status, things that I talked about also in the first interview, are less malleable than one might think. And if you advocate that something is less malleable than, say, more progressive people or social psychologists might say, then they, um, the implication is that that's how you wish it to be, right? And I'm just saying that these sex roles and gender roles that you see cross-culturally, they are the way they are, and they are fairly universal. And that's not how I want it to be. That is how I think it is. And in my view, if you want something to be a certain way, you have to know how it is to begin with. And so I think all the wishful thinking in the world about what men and women are like is actually not going to change what men and women are like. I mean, there are some narratives that I think are important. Another reason that I think people don't like evolutionary psychology is because that there are some very popular evolutionary psychologists who are well known like in you know the social sphere. So um, Steve Pinker, Jeffrey Miller, my partner, uh, me, we're a little bit louder on Twitter than other people. But there's also been some controversy about people. For example, there's a researcher called Satoshi Satoshi Kanazawa, and Satoshi uh, works at the London School of Economics, and he wrote a paper that said something to the effect of um, black women are less attractive because they have higher testosterone, something to that effect. And uh, it, it was, you know, it was a very odd thing to say. It was an odd blog. Uh, I don't think that he thought that it was going to be perceived as racist because that was not very smart on his part. So these are the evolutionary psychologists that people are more likely to hear about are those people who have very strong political views, right? And the people who are just getting on with their work and doing stuff that is, you know, some really amazing work that people are doing, oftentimes in the service of very progressive causes. There's even, you know, a survey from about 12 years ago done by Josh Tiber, uh, another evolutionary psychologist who works on Disgust, and Jeffrey Miller, showing that on average, people who take adaptationist views of evolutionary, or of psychology, like evolutionary psychologists, tend to be left-leaning. Um, most of these people are left-leaning, but those are not the people that people commonly hear about. So they think about evolutionary psychology, and they think about some very controversial stuff, even though that's not you know, what the mainstay of, of evolutionary psychology is. And finally, I just think, yeah, this evolutionary psychology kind of goes against this malleability argument, which the progressives don't like, and then it also compares people to animals and says, we are very much like non-human animals, right? We do things... We, you know, eat and shit and have sex yeah. and, 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 and have normal responses that others have. And we are, you know, as I'll, I'll say in this, in this lecture I'm giving tonight, you know, we're machines. That, they were designed by natural selection to do very th things like find mates, find food, etc. And people think this undermines human dignity. So the right wing also doesn't like that. And the left wing doesn't like that. This idea that we are essentially... Machines designed by natural and sexual selection, and the focus on sex. You know, there's a lot of reasons why people have a have a problem with it. So I think 
that if people really understood that evolutionary psychology is really just using the lens of evolution to come up with hypotheses about human behavior and, and human nature, and if they just thought, okay, these people, they, they come up with hypotheses, these things can get falsified, et cetera, then there wouldn't be such a you know, rabble about it as there is now about evolutionary psychology e either being evil and reactionary or a pseudoscience. Uh, if people knew more about what the mainstream was like. So do you think part of the problem with the way the progressives perceive evolutionary psychology is simply because you're denying their reality? That we're all the same, there are no differences between us? Yeah, I am denying their reality. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea that the progressives have, which I really have a lot of empathy for, the idea that if you actually make a narrative that people will stick to it. So if there's a narrative that we are all the same, it's actually going to make it more likely to be real because as humans, narratives actually form part of how we perceive the world and actually how we act in the world. If you have a teacher who thinks that you're especially gifted, even if you, you know, have an IQ of 80, right? <laughs> then, you, then you're gonna do much better than if you have a teacher who has more realistic expectations of you, shall we say. Mm -hmm. This even happens in relationships, right? There's actually evidence that positive delusions um, improve relationships. I had a huge argument with an ex-boyfriend about this actually, where we ended up both doing a deep dive. And I said, if you're deluded about how good I am, we're actually gonna have a better relationship. And he said, cool, I'm gonna cultivate positive delusions about you. <laughs> so there's a different, there's a, there's definitely a tension here between uh, truth and actually what, you know, could be beneficial uh, for people. But if, from my view, we are getting to the point in society and in science where we actually have to understand what the baseline is. We have to understand what differences actually happen in order to understand how to make things different. And I've talked about myself as being an evolutionary psychologist and also being a transhumanist. So transhumanism is the idea that we can use technology to improve ourselves, right? That we can use technology to augment our our cognition, to improve our morality even. Mm. Very interesting paper that I talk about where people say that they would actually rather improve their language ability or improve their memory than they would be likely to want to improve their morality. People are, mm. it's very weird actually. If you said, would you like to take a pill to improve the number of hours of sleep that you get per night? Would you like to be able to get by on less sleep? Would you like to be able to have better memory? People say that they would take a pill for that. People are least likely to say that they would take a pill to improve their moral views, right? But isn't that as well because if we have a high level of morality, that in a sense limits us and it limits our choices. Yes. So people, as I, as I think I talked about last time, I said, why do women like bad boys? People like potentially exploitative men because it's important in a society where many people are potentially exploitative to have some of that yourself. Mm. I think also people don't want to be disadvantaged in relation to other potentially exploitative people. And so being exploitative is sort of positional in that sense. You want to be a bit more exploitative than the average person. You want to be a, a bit less moral or be able to exploit moral loopholes a bit better than the average person. You know, no matter how good you think you are. And we have this moral view. We think that we're more moral than other people. Oh, I definitely am. <laughs> and uh, we, we talked about vegans last time and you said you're very funny for a vegan. And I, I didn't said realize, that actually. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't realize what a backhanded compliment <laughs> <laughs> But in, in essence, um, people think on average that they're more moral than, than other people. And even if you were to ask them, you know, how moral is somebody like like a vegan or Mother Teresa or somebody who never flies or whatever, uh, depending on what your moral views are, you would be likely to say that those people are, are still less moral than you are, although they might be more moral than the average person. But to get back to your question, you know, this kind of progressive view about malleability, yes, that's part of it. But part of it is also, as I will talk about, I'm giving a talk about this tonight and also in Ghent, is that people really buck against control. So Gina Rippon, who I did a sort of debate against on John Stossel's YouTube, I said, you know, she and I went back and forth. We weren't in the same room. But she wrote a really interesting book, uh, which is called The Gendered Brain, I think. And it's interesting in that it, it's, there's a lot of sophistry in the book, unfortunately. <laughs> She's a very nice woman. I think that she has really great aspirations. But her book is terrible. But her book is, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get through the whole thing. I got through about half of it. Um, yeah, she's just like, she's really critical of some fields and then she's not at all critical of something like stereotype threat, which 
has not been replicated at all, but in any case. So she says something to the effect of there's no structure or pattern that distinguishes male brains from female brains, and that's not true. If you look at a, a bunch of different structures in the brain, you can actually distinguish a male brain from a female brain with about 80% accuracy. And it doesn't even matter that much because you wouldn't be able to distinguish a physics professor from a murderer if looking at their brains. That doesn't mean they're not different, right? Mm. It's just It just means that our brain science or the ability to distinguish people based on brain structures isn't very good. But I think that what people are really bucking against as a society is this progressive idea that there are people in power and that there's a hierarchy and they're trying to take advantage of other people. It's all about power in this sense. And I think that something that is really atrophying our ability for science to actually make headway is our desire to not be controlled. So people don't want you to be able to guess anything about them based on whether or not they're male or female. So now people are saying that they're uh, non-binary or that they have these other very complex gender attributes because they don't want you to be able to say, OK, I'm going to have a very good idea of what your, your attributes are like. Uh, people, I was even in arguments on, on Twitter and other social media lately where they said you couldn't actually tell uh, above chance whether or not somebody was likely to have some medical conditions more or less based on their ethnicity. Or if you could, it was because of the discrimination and the social pressures that they faced, actually. So I talk about being an evolutionary psychologist and a transhumanist because I think that the best way to equalize our society and to make some people better off than who are currently worse off is actually through technology and through biological engineering rather than through changing perceptions. There's only so far that changing perceptions about who can do what can actually do, unfortunately. And I think you know, everybody is given a kind of genetic lottery ticket. Some people are born attractive. Some people are born smart. Some people are born with really good willpower. Some Thanks. people are not. <laughs> <laughs> some people are born with likability, Constantine. Some people are born with that haircut. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's a great stuff. But... but we were joking about it, but to me, there's a really serious side to what you're saying. And the problem that I find with progressivism is you're engaging essentially in a lie. It might be a well-meaning lie, but it is yeah. still a lie. And if you are lying about who you are fundamentally, that is a way to make yourself deeply, deeply miserable. I think I, I get what you're saying, but I don't entirely agree. So I think that there are some things that we can all be deluded about that are kind of important for everybody to be deluded about, right? The idea that you can be anything and do anything on an individual level, this kind of what they call the growth mindset. Yeah. We are incredibly limited by our genetic potential and the kind of hand that we're dealt when we're born. But if you were to think about that realistically all the time, it would be really bad, right? I don't really think that humans have free will. I think that we live in a deterministic universe, and I think that humans are part of that. But the idea that you can change your behavior, it's, it's true that if you tell people we live in a deterministic universe, they start to think things like it's less important to act morally or it's less important to be good to other people. So it is true that some degree of self-deception and deception I think is good, but I think if we are going to make headway in terms of science, that that deception can't be circulated by the people who are the experts. It can't be circulated that, for example, um, some ethnic disparities in health are entirely due to social stigma and discrimination. We have to understand that men and women have biological, psychological differences and that genetics also have a very strong determining factor in our psychology, not just you know, ind ind individually, but also potentially between populations. This is all stuff that's super important. And if we don't get that, we're going to keep trying to make interventions that don't work. Well, this is the interesting thing. Like, uh, I watch a bit of Joe Rogan's podcast every now and again. This is one of the things. He's someone who's definitely advocating for people to have a growth mindset on the one hand. But on the other hand, there are times when that uh, ideology clashes with reality. So, for example, a guy who's never fought in the Ultimate Fighting Championship, the UFC, yeah. the, like CM Punk, <laughs> suddenly decides that he can do it. And yeah. he goes in and gets his ass kicked because there's a limitation to that mindset. But equally, it's useful to have on an individual level. Yeah. Anyway, uh, let, let's move on to talk about your upcoming book, Yeah, uh, which is called How to Train Your Boyfriend. My girlfriend is never getting that book. <laughs> She's never been made aware of it. Sorry, carry on. Uh, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I'm sending it to her directly. Uh, in, she'll be in the post, Ellie. Yeah. Anyway, uh, 
I, I, we got a chance to, to listen to you talk about it. You sent us an advanced copy. It's fascinating stuff. I, I think it's something that, you know, you, you've gendered it for reasons that we'll get into. Yeah. But generally speaking, I think every human being in the world is interested in essentially getting other people to do what they want, if you put it crudely like that, right? That's right, right yeah. There's lots of stuff that, that we all want, you know. So I, I, tell us a little bit about of... Uh, you know, where, what the angle is and some of the kind of maybe practical applications, like how do you get your podcast pardon to stop frowning during interviews? <laughs> you know, what would be the best way to achieve that? So I've been reading a ton of B.F. Skinner, mm -hmm. who is a very famous, well, the most famous behaviorist, basically. Mm -hmm. And he was probably the most famous uh, psychologist for some period of time, you know, behind uh, Freud. And he just had really, you know, fascinating ideas. A lot of these ideas that I've just told you about control, for example, uh, that people really buck against control, and that's part of what's addling the science of psychology um, come from Skinner. But to, to how to train your boyfriend. Mm -hmm. So the basic idea is that we all have evolved abilities to try and control other people. We all have evolved the ability to use reinforcement and punishment to try to control other people. And because we lived in an environment you know, that was, we had very little attention to break off. We had lots of other things that were taking our attention. We had limited amounts of time. We were trying often to use the quickest, dirtiest way to control other people. And that is often punishment. So one of the main ideas is that people overuse punishment and they underuse reward when they're interacting with other people. And there's this very common idea that punishment doesn't work. It absolutely doesn't work, <laughs> right? Otherwise, we wouldn't. Well, one reason this is a tautology, but one reason is that we actually wouldn't be so inclined uh, to punish other people. So, how to train your boyfriend is essentially trying to appeal to women's self-interests about how to try and get what they want, but also it's a way of trying to limit something that I call the alpha, which is the part of your mind that is actually very intent on controlling the behavior of other people. And controlling the behavior of other people has been very important throughout our evolutionary history. And we're not very good at it, in part, because we actually can't really be cognizant. We're not consciously controlling other people. The more you consciously control other people, the more other people are going to resist your control. So if I tell you, Constantine, you really need to go on a vacation or a holiday. I, I fucking do. Here, Believe you me, right? I'm straight. <laughs> you, you, you might be like, oh, that's a great idea, Diana. And I'm like, let me tell you my package to Cancun, right? Right. You're going to take my, my, you're going to be more cynical or skeptical of me if I have some self-interest. Mm. And so if we're not aware, if we're self-deceived about our self-interest and controlling other people, then we're going to be much better at it. But another aspect of this this idea about control is that the best punishments and reinforcements happen very soon after a behavior, within milliseconds, if not you know, within uh, under a second of that behavior. And so if you are hyper aware, this is the same kind of thing as the you know, take your hand off the stove principle, right? If you think this stove is hot, I should remove my hand. By the time you've thought all of that, your hand is completely burned. In the same way as if you do a behavior that I like or I don't like, Right. If I deliberate about whether or not it's a good behavior for me or not, rather than that, I would just have an emotion and instantly punish you or reinforce you. And I do think that this is a lot of the way humans behave to one another, especially in romantic relationships, because those were such high stakes situations, especially for women. And so men, as I, I talk about, is, is that men have always had an ability to control other people in a very simple way. And that is either through force or threat of force. Mm. Right. I mean, big men especially yeah. have this ability, whereas women have not really had this capacity as much. And so they had to develop more sophisticated methods. And So women are better at it? I mean, my view is that women are better at it and they spend more time uh, considering it. Uh, and, you know, certainly I went on a 10-day meditation retreat in... Um, Hertfordshire, I really recommend meditation retreats because you get an idea if you're on a what they call a dopamine fast. You have like you're very very significantly bored a lot of the time. You got nothing to keep your attention. You got no YouTube. You got no phone. You got no books. You have no conversation. You are really in this very austere environment. And what is it that you're thinking about all the time when you're in this austere environment? Well, I, I mean, I asked a bunch of the women that I was on meditation retreat with, and they often think about conflicts they had with other people. They think about conversations, things that they should have said or should not have said, ways that they should have engaged with other people, people that they should have forgiven or not. And to me, what's happening in your brain when it's devoid of stimulation a lot is thinking about how you could better or your regrets about social control. But 
Well, one thing I found really interesting about, well, there were many things, but one thing in particular was these women who had a highly developed sense of alpha and were very good at it were far more likely to pass on their genes than women who weren't. Yes. So the main idea that I have here is that it's, it's definitely an evolutionary psychology kind of argument is that, that women are not built in a way that's like easy to, easy to please and unlikely to care about the behavior of their partner. Uh, because those kinds of women who didn't care about those things, uh, they didn't actually try and control the behavior of their partner, uh, would have more likely been evolutionary dead ends. So we talk about this a lot in evolutionary psychology, even though it's, it's a difficult thing to actually prove, which is something called the mismatch hypothesis. And the idea is that our modern environment differs in many fundamental ways from our ancestral environment. And the ancestral environment is not just whatever cavemen or whatever whatever <laughs> movie you want to think about it, right? It's also um, the whole history of mammalian evolution. It's also um, you know, all of the, the hominids that, that led up to us, right? So that's our environment of evolutionary adaptedness. And one of the main differences in, that, in those environments is that those environments were much more dangerous. They were much more stressful. And the stakes of whether or not you were going to be able to have living children were much higher. And so in my view, the way we engage in relationships, especially the way that women engage with men, is often as if whether or not you took out the rubbish is a life or death situation. <laughs> because if you are with a man who actually doesn't consider your needs or who is neglectful, another weird mismatch is to not see somebody all day, every day, or not see anybody interacting with other people. That's a very strange mismatch as well. But if you don't see a man engaging competently with your needs, then that's going to be something that's going to be upsetting, even though it's no longer a life or death situation. Hi, guys. We're really excited to have a brand new sponsor at Trigonometry. Welcome back to the, my bedroom, or as it's called in the business, Palacio Orgasmo. Welcome, ladies. Jen's not that happy about you being here, but I've got a little something for you because we've got a brand new sponsor and it's called Sons. And Sons focuses on men's physical health. In particular, lads, the one thing we don't often talk about, which is the old barnet. Absolutely, it's hair loss treatment. And what Sons do is they've got free online consultations with GPs, although let's be fair, in the present climate, every consultation with a GP is now online and they also deliver direct to your door medically proven products that help reduce and treat hair loss and over nine out of 10 men. So you get the barnet looking like this, not looking like Constantine. They're reasonably priced, there's no contract, you pay monthly with no hidden charges. All you have to do is take the consultation in less than two minutes and then the pharmacy will deliver to your door within three days. So guys, in order to show hair loss who's boss, go to www.sons.co.uk. Use the code TRIGGER and you'll be able to get your first month for £10. That's right, your first month for £10 and you'll get hair like this and not like my lovely co-host who is desperately thinning on top. I, I didn't actually have to say that, I just thought I'd hammer it home. Something I, I want just to, to popped into my mind. One of the things that I've uh, been thinking about as well, there's this, in, in relationships between men and women, there is this sense that on the one hand, the woman would like to be able to influence the man to do essentially whatever she wants. But on the other hand, I have some personal experience of the fact that if a man kind of stands up for himself, so to yeah. speak, and pushes back against that, that can be actually quite perceived as quite high value by by their female partner. Yeah. What, what's that all about? So there's a thing called shit testing in the red pill community. You can call it testing the bond. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different ways that you can talk about it. But let's say I have a partner, and I do, <laughs> and, um, and I say, you know, tell me you love me, tell me you care about me. He can do that all day long. That's very cheap talk, right? But if I make a scenario incredibly unpleasant for him. I act unreasonable, beyond belief, and then I see, okay, where does his patience break, right? Is it 15 minutes? Is it 20 minutes? Is it two hours? I have a very patient partner, <laughs> he's really lovely. Um, he is, yeah. He's, he's very patient with me. Um, so I try not to do this, but I do understand that I am in this kind of 
this kind of scenario. So on the one hand, if he's incredibly patient with me, I think this person is very committed and heavily invested in me. But a man who is high status is necessarily not going to put up with as much bullshit yeah. <laughs> as a man who isn't, right? And so um, when you when you test somebody in this way, when you ask them not to just tell you how they feel, but you actually say, I'm going to engineer a scenario. This is obviously stuff that totally doesn't occur consciously. And I'll tell you about when I'm most likely to do it. Uh, then you actually see, okay, there's a certain threshold at which he's no longer going to put up with where I'm at or what I'm, what I'm imposing on him. And at that point, you think, okay, this man has got either other options or is high status. There's this thing called the polygyny threshold model. So the idea is that women either had a choice of um, having a monogamous relationship with a somewhat lower status man, because 80% of societies throughout evolutionary history of human societies have been somewhat polygynous. That means very high status men occasionally had more than one partner, whereas low status men generally had one partner. And there were some men who were out of the game entirely. It's we call them the Genghis Khan model. <laughs> That's right, the Genghis Khan model. Yeah. 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 And, I, and I say, or the Geng Premier League football model. <laughs> Genghis, Genghis Khan doesn't, doesn't, the Genghis Khan doesn't like have like half of 1% of the world as his descendants because he mastered the art of sensual massage. Yeah. It's because he, he killed thousands of men, had sex with thousands of women. And often these were the women that no longer had uh, men to protect them. Um, where was I at? <laughs> Sorry, I, I shouldn't have jumped in like that. Uh, but yeah. you, you were essentially talking about the fact that uh, most eight, over eighty percent of yeah. societies oh, in yeah. history. Oh yeah, polygynous. Yeah. Yeah. So this is um, one thing that happens is that um, a woman who is with a very high status man is sharing that man oftentimes with other women throughout evolutionary history, even now to some extent, mm. right? Mm. And so he has other options, so he's not going to put up with as much. It's just a very simple market forces kind of yeah. model. It's yeah. very, very simple. And so if he's not going to put up with as much, she thinks, okay, he's got other possible options. And therefore, it's, it's a circular thing, but if he's putting up with less stuff, that means that he has other options. When he has other options, he puts up with less stuff. And I'm taking some of the red pill stuff that that people really rail against. And I'm saying, how can women use this in a way to understand better themselves and their relationships with men? And what's the answer to that question? <laughs> well, you have to read my book, <laughs> which will come out at some point. <laughs> and now th there's a counter argument to that. And I can imagine the progressives, probably somebody with a, an indecently short you haircut. You feel really bad about the progressives <laughs> today, don't no, you? No, I fucking hate them. With three colors in their hair of indiscriminate gender who'd be he, saying... He hasn't had his breakfast. Sorry about this, guys. <laughs> yeah, I haven't had my re re requisite carbohydrate or nicotine. But who was saying, hang on, aren't you just teaching people, especially women, to be manipulative? Yeah, manipulative is a dirty word. But we're all manipulative. So so I, I talk about babies. Uh, babies cry when they don't get what they want. Mm. You know, there's a reason why babies like to be held and bobbed up and down. It's because if you're holding a baby and you're bobbing them up and down, there's nothing else that you could possibly be doing that's useful, right? <laughs> a baby knows that they have all of your attention when, when you're doing that. And do people call babies manipulative? I don't think they do because babies are unaware of what they're actually doing. So the idea is that you're not manipulative unless you actually are aware of what you're doing. And if you shame people for being aware of how they're being manipulative, then they're just more... They're running more automatically. Yeah, they're, right? I was going to say, it's just yeah, being manipulative, the, the kind of automatic pilot manipulation that mm. people tend to do is actually much worse than any kind of conscious manipulation that you could engage in. And the thing, the problem people have with conscious manipulation is it's because it's a characteristic of sociopaths and mm. psychopaths, right? Psychopaths and sociopaths are very aware of how they're manipulating other people. But a lot of what we're doing in relationships with other people is manipulation. And my view is that if we're cynical about our own behavior, then we can actually figure out what's the best way of getting what I want as opposed to what's the automatic way that I'm trying to get what I want. So interesting thing that happens in a long, so I was in a long distance relationship for a long time and now I've moved in with my partner. We're getting married um, in a month's time actually. And so one thing that I noticed is that when we reconnected again after we've been apart for several months, I was really angry with him in some sense. Like I would go see him or he, especially if I was in one place and he was leaving, I would feel a desire to be punitive towards him about small things before he left. And 
what's happening basically is that my evolved psychology doesn't know that he's not leaving because he wants to go off with somebody else or that he's not leaving because he's leaving me and abandoning me. It's because he's got to, to work somewhere else or I have to leave, right? And so when I would see him again, none of the romantic stuff that he had done, none of the phone conversations we had were really mapping onto him in person. Jeffrey, you're a saint, man. <laughs> <laughs> right? None of that. It's like, it's like, it's like uh, you know, like a, a cat hissing at its reflection in the mirror. Like, I understand consciously what's going on. Yeah. Mm. It's like when you see a, a optical illusion. You can understand consciously what's going on, but you still see it. And so even though I know consciously what's going on, I know that I'm going to do a lot more kind of testing the bond if I haven't seen my partner in a month's time, because in some sense, I'm going to be saying, I want to test you. Are you still invested in me? Are you? St what's your status like right now? Right. I want to test all those things, because what he says, what people say is cheap talk. People can say whatever they want. And so I think humans have evolved to test one another in this way. And you see this, it's, it's funny when people say that this doesn't happen with adults because it happens with children all the time. The idea is that we kind of grow out of it. But when a toddler throws a tantrum or a baby cries or any, you know, you see if you go in anywhere where people are taking care of children, you see children just completely manipulating adults. Mm. And in some sense, actually not in some sense, in almost every sense, adults really cultivate that. Mm. They really cultivate their child's ability to manipulate them. Oh, absolutely. As a former teacher, I used to see it all the time. My favorite question that the parent used to ask me was, how do I stop my child from using the iPad? <laughs> and that, that I would get that at least twice every parent's evening. Yeah. And I would say, well, it's very simple. You just take it off them. <laughs> and they went, but I can't do that because they'll get upset. This is, this is interesting. There's a really great Brian Kaplan book called Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids where he talks about, it was actually a book I think he wrote to try to get his wife to have two more kids. <laughs> right. Yeah, and he says, you know, most of what happens with children and their, their educational attainment and stuff is actually just genetic. So if you just give them like a nice nurturing environment, you don't neglect them mm. and you don't abuse them, um, then they'll generally turn out fine. But because of this progressive idea that the environment matters so much, there's become a signaling about how much you're willing to invest in your kid. I think some of it has to do with like attachment parenting. You know, you don't want to be pushing your kid away in a carriage. You want to be wearing them all the time, this kind of thing. And I recently read an amazing essay from B.F. Skinner about something he designed for his second daughter, which is called an air crib. And he says that he got down taking care of a baby down to only an hour and a half a day. But, it, you know, we don't count laundry. So essentially he designed this air crib <laughs> um, and it's got a plastic sheet in it and the air quality inside is regulated for a newborn at 86 degrees. I'm going to build one of these things. <laughs> it's regulated at 86 degrees and then the air quality is filtered through, right? And then the baby only has to wear a diaper doesn't have to wear any clothes. Because if you look at parents dealing with children, they're like taking on tiny cardigans, pulling off tiny cardigans, putting on their tiny shoes, taking off their tiny shoes. They're always dressing them up and doing things. Skinner basically says, you just keep them in a temperature controlled environment with the air filtered and they can wiggle waggle any way they want. Newborns wanna always be moving around, not newborns, but babies wanna always be moving around. And there was this incredible rumor like, total urban legend that his daughter was t miserable and that she tried to kill herself because she lived in this crib most of the time until she was about two years old. And what Skinner is saying is that they looked at all of the stuff that parents do for children and they said, what is necessary for the child's psychological and physical well-being and what isn't? And when it wasn't necessary for their well-being, they just cut it out, mm. right? And the, the kid ended up totally fine. So what I think people are doing when they like really hothouse their kids in this way, of course, total disclaimer, I have no kids yet. I, I'm, you know, you're going to see me in a couple of years potentially. And I'm going to be like one of these, you know, baby wearing women who just, you know, like my boob is constantly in my kid's mouth yeah. until they're like 10 years old. Like, you know, I have no idea how, like what kind of, that's the scary thing about motherhood actually. Like that crazy woman from Game of Thrones. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's really going to be you. That's that's you're going to be, be shoving people through the moon door. <laughs> Incredibly scary thing about motherhood is that I have no idea how fundamental my personality change is going to be. Yeah. It's so scary. But, and that leads us really nicely on because you would t you we touched on it earlier about how we are machines who are designed to pass on our code. Yeah. So really, are we just a slave to our hormones? When you and you said yourself about motherhood that you don't know how you're going to behave. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's that's the really scary thing about it. We're 
I don't know if slave is the right word, but I would say that we are definitely, you know, we are determined. And luckily, you know, we can change our environments. Like I can, you know, I have some decision about who I spend time with. Other environments and influences have on me. But in some sense, I have no control over that because that's a process that's going to happen. And I'm going to be beholden to my hormones. I mean, you even find this in day-to-day life that you can feel anxious or depressed and you don't don't know how to hack yourself. You don't actually know how to change how you feel. And there's a, a lot of really great stuff about this. There's a really good book out um, by Randy Nessie called Good Reasons for Bad Feelings. And he talks about mental health and mental illness from this Darwinian and evolutionary perspective. And I just think it's incredibly important to think about yourself in this way. If you think about yourself as a machine that's designed to perpetuate your code or that's designed to perpetuate your code not just through direct reproduction but also potentially for caring for family, caring for friends, building a good reputation, all these kinds of things, then you will have a much better understanding of why you feel bad, why you feel good, what's working for you and and what isn't. And I think a Darwinian perspective does have an incredible promise for improving individual lives is if we understand it well enough. Well, one of the, the, the interesting like tidbits of information you mentioned in the book is that uh, the strongest predictor of, a, of a, an argument between uh, a, 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 in, in a relationship is yeah. blood sugar levels. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So people are essentially arguing because they haven't eaten, basically. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but the low blood sugar is, a, yeah, so this is an interesting feature of punishment. So as I said, uh, if you want to get somebody, like if you want Francis to stop frowning, <laughs> if you want to get Francis to stop frowning. Yes, I do. I, I, you've right? got my full undivided attention <laughs> You there. could like put a shock collar on him and you could shock him every time he frowns. <laughs> Anton, That's can we get one of those? <laughs> for next time, let's get one for tomorrow, mate. That actually gives you a really quick, easy way of doing it. Yeah. If you want him to stop no, no, doing I'm it. No, I'm fine there. <laughs> it's fine then. I'm sold. <laughs> I don't need to go on. But another way to get somebody yeah. to do something you want is to shape their behavior otherwise. Right. So if you want to get a dog to sit, first you reward them for looking at you, then you reward them for their bottom moving slightly towards the ground, and then you, that's an iterative process. That's actually much more complicated than just uh, punishing somebody is. So what you see in non-human animals is that punishment is often the first course of action. So if you feel bad, there's some chance that somebody around you made that happen. Right. Mm-hmm. And so you automatically punish them. You see this in non-human animals. So there's this kind of sadistic experiment they did where they put two rats in a cage, one's tied up, One's not. And they electrified the floor. And what happens when you electrify the floor? The one rat attacks the other rat. The free rat attacks the tied up rat. Yes, that's right. The free rat attacks the tied up rat just in case it's the tied up rat's fault. (laughs) Right? And you see this. You think, think, oh, we're smarter than rats. No, we're not smarter than rats because if I'm hungry, I'm going to be bitchy Mm. to whoever's around because it might be their fault that I haven't been fed. Yeah. Well, we're taking you out for lunch after (laughs) this, so it's it's (laughs) all good. Feed me. (laughs) It's all good. We're definitely going to feed you. So, uh, so this is you know one thing that happens, and you also see this like um, it's very funny. This there's a kind of meta punishment that happens. So um, this this guy (laughs) that I was friends with, we were out to dinner, and then his wife calls him up, and she said, "Where are the towels?" And he said, um, I put them in the dryer. And she hangs up really abruptly. So it was funny because she wanted him to have done something wrong. She wanted him to have left them out <laughs> wet so that she could yell at him. Mm. And then when she couldn't yell at him, she was upset. So we also get reinforced for engaging in punishment. And we can actually punish people for not doing something that would let us punish them. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so there's this, there's this stuff that – there's this, these cycles that happen. And I think that understanding – your impetus to punish, especially when you're hungry. So one thing that there was a weird explosion on Twitter recently about was fasting. I think fasting is really good. I think it's really good for health. And I do like a week-long fast or a 10-day fast twice a year. I think it's really good for you. Uh, There were lots of people speculating that I have an eating disorder. I love food just fine. But you're not starving if you have food. If you mean you you have food on you, (laughs) right? Um, So... What happens is you definitely don't want to be around your romantic partner like the first two days, potentially. You can be, but you have to just decide that you're not going to talk to each other very much um, because you will be incredibly difficult to be around. You will be very, very irritable. And part of that irritability is to punish kind of whoever's around, no matter Mm. whether they've done anything wrong or not. 
And is part of that, like, let's say in the woman's case, is it like, well, this guy hasn't brought on, brought home a hunk of meat recently? <laughs> is that it? Well, no, we're, when we're being really, like, crude, you know, whatever, clan of the bear, whatever, whatever that stupid movie is, yeah. when, yeah, when Jeffrey and I do joke about that. He's like, I'm sorry I didn't bring you a kill. <laughs> like, like, I'm hungry. Um, yeah, so this is an interesting thing about, yeah, about punishment. Um, but another interesting thing about punishment and women is that women really want men to do stuff for them because they want to, right? So I have an interesting mm. story about this. I had a, a boyfriend who, um, lovely, lovely guy actually, but on our, my first ever birthday, he came from a family where they didn't exchange cards, they didn't exchange gifts. So for my for first birthday that we were together, he bought me a Kindle book and no card. And I tore into him. Mm. <laughs> I didn't want to, it was like, I just couldn't help it. Like mm. I was really, I'm, I'm very punitive by nature. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Latin American side. <laughs> Yeah. Jeffrey, <laughs> you have uh, sincere <laughs> condolences, mate. <laughs> very punitive by nature. I, I, this is partly like me trying to control it. Yeah. So I realized what I had done. I felt bad about it, but he got me, a, you know, that, that year, he bought me a card like the next day. And then the next year, um, it was my birthday again. And like I had almost completely forgotten about the total mm. like shit show, <laughs> the, total, <laughs> the total shit fit I had thrown the year before. And then I found out he bought me like a very nice set of earrings mm. and a necklace. And uh, he got me a card and I was very pleased. But then I realized he told me that he had gone to the jewelry shop three separate times. That he'd spent, I don't know how long, picking out a card for me and that he was incredibly anxious giving me the gift. Picking out my gift and picking out my card had brought him no pleasure because he was doing those things to avoid my punishment. He wasn't doing those things because I had been so delighted when he had given me a card or that. I had shaped his behavior in any way. And you see this with, with dogs and other animals too. If you punish them for not doing a behavior, like if you punish a dog for not coming quickly enough, they will come fairly quickly, but you'll see the ambivalence about whether what they're gonna do because they're approaching the, the person who punished them. Whereas if you give them a treat every time they come quickly, they'll bound over, there's no ambivalence about it at all. And the same thing happens in, in human relationships where if you get what you want through punishment, you know, if, if, if I don't want my partner to be on his phone when he's at dinner with me and I punish him for doing that, I don't care why he's not on his phone. I just care that he's not on his phone, mm -hmm. right? But if I want somebody to give me a gift because they love me, then if you punish them for not giving you a gift, this, you're, you're gonna get Stockholm Syndrome. You're not gonna get, <laughs> You know, which is a certain kind of love, right? <laughs> but you're not going to get the kind of motivation that you want. I was attending a, uh, a, a lecture by an education expert who uh, was talking about reward and punishment and essentially getting children to behave. Yeah. And he was saying that it's been proven that it's not how severe the punishment is, it's how regular the punishment is. Okay. So if people don't, children don't behave, and essentially adults as well, by how punitive something is, it's if they know something is going to happen. Like yeah. if they know, they, if they come back from the pub 15 minutes late, they're going to get the cold shoulder. Yeah. Then if sh you go absolutely nuts once every six times. Yeah. What do, what do you mean they go absolutely nuts every yeah, no, Like they just lose their temper. Oh, they lose, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, the He's back onto men and women, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're talking about coming back <laughs> from the pub. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. These, yeah. these five-year-olds are coming back from the pub 15 minutes late. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a funny yeah. joke about that where a guy, um, there's two guys and they're talking about how they came home last night to their wives. And one guy says, well, I got so drunk last night. I went out to the pub and I knew that I was gonna catch hell. So I came home, I put the car in neutral, <laughs> I turned the lights off, I snuck up the stairs, I was as quiet as a mouse, and my wife still woke up and gave me total hell. Yeah. And um, his mate says, well, that's funny because I came home, I r raced into the driveway, I screeched the brakes, I left the lights on, I slammed the door, I came up the stairs, I slapped my wife on the ass and I said, how about it? And she was still sound asleep. <laughs> 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 so I think that what you're talking about is like if you catch hell every, every six times, consistent punishment can be really good. I think even just random punishment can be more frightening. Generally people are, if they really want to do a behavior, they're trying to get in through uh, loopholes. And I found this myself, right? I'm trying to make a Skinner box for myself to write this book. I'm trying to engineer things where I'm actually rewarding people for punishing me for not getting my word count done for the day. I'm actually trying to build in accountability procedures. And it's amazing to me that we don't have more kind of 
these kinds of protocols in place. Like, there's no way that you can at work sit in a Skinner box with like a panopticon where like somebody's watching what you're doing because in some sense, we all want to avoid control. That's part of the reason why we buck against categories that actually can accurately describe our behavior. That's part of why we don't want to be genetically tested. That's part of why we don't believe in determinism. It's actually because we want to believe that we have free will and we believe that other people can't control us. But to me, it's really weird that we don't have better systems to make people productive. If you actually had like a Skinner box for me to live in, right, where you could regulate my access to social media, if you could control every aspect of my behavior so I could get what my my goals are mm. done in a more effective way and have more free time, I would absolutely sign up. Actually, having said this, I thought probably the most productive people on the planet, and this is just a theory, and maybe this is something for people to explore, asexuals. Imagine how much more you could get done if you didn't feel the urge every absolutely 15 minutes. True. Yeah, this actually gets us onto poly. So people are always like, oh, polyamory, you know, because uh, Jeffrey's talked about being polyamorous and I've talked about being polyamorous. It's very funny because people always think he convinced me. Like, <laughs> like he definitely has <laughs> Haven't power. spoken to you. Uh, <laughs> I'm not so sure. Um, so people are like, oh, my gosh, polyamory must be like so, so complicated. And I was like, yeah, monogamy is also complicated. If you want the least complicated thing, just be celibate. Like that's if that's if simplicity is what you're after, mm. don't have any relationships with anybody. That is by far the, the if you don't want any drama or complications, the easiest use of your time. But, yeah, I have met some really amazing people who are um, asexual and I have wished at times that there was some kind of ability to, to change myself so I could be asexual for some period of time. Uh, apparently, you know, some parts of child rearing are like that anyways. <laughs> <laughs> another thing for you to look forward to, Jeffrey. Well, okay, and with another, and, uh, <laughs> well, it's like, it's like uh, another Game of Thrones reference, Lord Varys, the one who's a, a eunuch. eunuch yeah. Yeah, yeah, he gets all the shit done in, in that. And probably a great singing voice as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, but I was going to ask you, uh, this, uh, you talk about this urge to avoid control. What is the evolutionary stimulus, the evolutionary rationale for avoiding other people controlling your actions? Okay. That's a really good question. That's always what people say when they want to delay answering a question. It's <laughs> <laughs> a great question. So uh, each of us has adaptive strategies, right? My adaptive strategy might be to increase my status, to improve my reputation, for other people to think I'm moral, et cetera, right? And then uh, I might have a, a person in my life who has different strategy. So let's say I have a partner and my adaptive strategy is to monopolize his resources and his attention completely. And his adaptive strategy is to give me just enough resources and attention to keep me around, but also to see many other women on the side, right? Mm. What he might do is try to control how much I demand of his attention. And what I might want to do is punish him every time he doesn't give me enough attention. So that's one very familiar kind of dynamic that people have. Um, if somebody is able to control you, then that necessarily means that they will be able to get what they want from an adaptive strategy perspective. Mm. They'll be able to say that they have better status than you or have a better reputation than you or that they're more moral than you. So they'll be able to get over on you potentially. And that's why we're so resistant to control. And you also see this in families, right? Children tend to be pretty credulous about their parents up until a point, And then they get very rebellious as teenagers. And why do teenagers get rebellious? Well, you start to buck against what your parents want. Your parents' values and your parents' desires for you are going to be in their best self-interest. But your self-interest as a newly Reprodu you know, reproductively viable person as somebody who can choose your own mates and things is going to be different than theirs. So in every relationship, there is conflict. You even see this in pregnancy, right? A fetus actually causes gestational diabetes because the fetus wants sugar to be in the bloodstream for as long as possible so that they can get as big as possible because the fetus has only one chance to get big and strong, whereas the mother doesn't want to have gestational diabetes. She wants her body to be able to use to have further offspring. So in every relationship, no matter how beautiful, <laughs> and people talk about pregnancy that way a lot, the reason that pregnancy isn't entirely delightful is because there is conflict between mother and fetus. And there is conflict in terms of the end goals in every relationship. 
And that's part of why, you know, monogamy and pair bonds uh, make sense because it aligns people's uh, strategies. You see this in non-human animals as well, that in uh, species where the males have multiple uh, females, that they're less invested necessarily in each one of them. I, when I was reading your book, there were, it, it was fascinating all the way through. There were certain moments that particularly piqued my interest, and particularly when you touched on BPD, borderline personality oh, yeah. disorder. Would you like to go and talk about that Not a little really. bit more? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so borderline personality disorder, um, there is this idealization and devaluation. That's one, that's one major component mm. of it. And I'm familiar with BPD because I've made... I had a couple close friends who had BPD, mm. and I have a very, very close family member who has BPD. Um, and there are funny stories to tell about her that maybe I'll leave for another time. <laughs> yeah. um, they're funny now in retrospect. Yeah. At the time, they were not very funny. Diana, just for anyone who doesn't <laughs> know at all what borderline yeah. personality disorder is, just start from the very beginning. Start from basic. the very beginning. Mm. So borderline personality disorder is called borderline personality disorder actually because it was unclear if it was a personality disorder or a more significant disorder, mm. right? They were unclear about where it actually fell. So it's not at all like dissociative identity disorder or multiple personalities. It's actually a disorder where you have very volatile relationships. These people often have problems with drugs and alcohol. They have problems keeping any kind of romantic relationship. And they also vacillate very quickly between idealizing and devaluing their uh, partners. Mm. This and, is someone who look, looks up to you like you're God one minute and then just yes. thinks you're the worst person mm. in the world the next day. Yes. It's and why I was to wonder why those people struggle to keep <laughs> relationships. Yeah, um, so a big part of it is volatility. Yeah. But um, if, you, if you define borderline personality disorder, some people would argue with me and say it's not more common in women than men. I think it's much more common in women than men. If you want to say that men have an equal rate of it, you have to define it. I think quite differently. So I'll just talk about women's borderline personality disorder. But I think all women have a touch of this, and I think it's kind of like hyper training. So you can be incredibly reinforcing to somebody one minute. These women escalate romantic involvement often very, very quickly. And like I dated a woman who had borderline personality disorder, and there was just so many amazing things about her. Like she uh, knew everything about me. She had so many pictures of me in her room. We were at university <laughs> together. The people knew who I was because pictures of me. She knew all my preferences, all my favorite things. If I told her a story once, she would remember it forever, right? She had an amazing social memory. But I took her to a party once, right? It was like a Halloween party around this time of year many years ago. And um, she was just wearing like a coat and lingerie. And I literally talked to somebody else for five minutes. And she left and started walking down a not dangerous part of Texas, but a dark part of Texas in the middle of the night in just lingerie and a coat in order to punish me, basically, for talking to somebody else, for diverting my attention for five minutes. And women who have borderline personality disorder also um, more likely to do what's called parasuicide, to say that they are going to attempt suicide or uh, threaten to attempt suicide. So what I talk about in, in the book is basically that this is like, a, like training in overdrive. Right. It's uh, these women can be they're really good at remembering your preferences. They know what's uniquely reinforcing to you. Uh, sex is something that's uniquely reinforcing to men. They know how to use that. They know how to use their attractiveness. They're incredibly compelling in many ways, but they can also be incredibly punitive. And the, the family member that I have is amazing amazing at figuring out where the jugular is of somebody. What is like the worst thing that you could say to somebody that they're going to be thinking about for months or years? Mm. And this is something else that they're really, really good at. And it's it's an incredible, it's a kind of a superpower, but in the sense that, you know, in X-Men or any of these other movies, you see some people who have superpowers use them for good and some people use them for evil. I do think that women have this ability. And if you know about what you're trying to do with it, you can use it to really strengthen and improve your relationships rather than make somebody else miserable and control them completely. But it sounds as if there's traits of narcissism there as well. Mm. In that there's similarities between the two, or have I got that completely wrong? That mm, is a no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've learned to read it. Yeah. <laughs> narcissism, there's, there's often a commonality with narcissism. I think narcissism gets defined so broadly now that I actually don't know 
you know, there's all these videos on YouTube and things about like how to deal with a narcissist. And narcissist is kind of just code now, psychology code for like Asshole. shitty person. Yeah. <laughs> shitty person. <laughs> that, yeah. yeah. So narcissism, yeah, there is some some degree of it. And then there, there's this thing called fragile narcissism, which even expands the definition further, where you're like, okay, well, somebody who thinks really highly of themselves, but sometimes also doesn't think highly of themselves, that's, that's kind of everybody. Mm. So there is an aspect of it there in that they think that they're so important that somebody else should give over all their attention and energy and resources to them. So I would say that is actually accurate, yeah. And one thing I wanted to, to deal with before we wrap up the interview, you talked about the differences between men and women in, in some of these areas of yeah. man, manipulating other people, or that's a negative word, but influence on other yeah. people, let's say. Uh, one of the experiments you talk about is that uh, a four-year study, I think, of, of couples yeah. found that if the woman was less forgiving at the end of that four-year period, the man was essentially better trained, let's yeah. say. But it wasn't replicated on the other side. If the, if the man was less forgiving and you used punishment and whatever, the woman didn't tend, tend to change. Yeah. So what what is that all about? And maybe, you know, since since the book is gendered in, t towards women, uh, what are some tips for men for how to behave with their romantic partner if, if she is female? Okay. So forgiveness is just the suspension of, of punishment. So anger, <laughs> uh, it's, it's forgiveness is just when you stop being angry. Yeah. And it's a form of reinforcement in that, in the same way as if I was just hitting you over the head. I don't know why I keep looking at you, Francis. <laughs> it's just hitting you over the head. And then I stopped, it would be reinforcing, even though me not hitting you over the head right now is not reinforcing. I know why you keep looking at him, because uh, out of the two of us, in your mind, he's the only potential available romantic partner. Because <laughs> you think I'm gay for some <laughs> reason, Diana. So let's go, we'll go back to this. I thought that constant. When, when, the, when in the last interview, I kept saying like, well, you don't have to worry about this constant. Yeah, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I remember at the time I was like, a gay Jewish Russian. Can you tell me about how you sought asylum? <laughs> 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 you poor, poor thing. And, and you see, this is the way of going for the juggler. And I was thinking for like a month after that, what are the vibes that I'm sending off here? Well, you said my partner, Francis, and then I, I met Francis. <laughs> you guys really- Never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> you guys should do something for the female gays right now. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, yes, I, I did totally think Constantine was gay. So and then this, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the partner thing is, is super weird. Mm. Um, so uh, hitting somebody over the head, forgiveness. Yes. So in this long-term study, they found that a woman who uh, whose forgiveness increased over time had a partner whose conscientiousness increased over time. That's a very, very fancy way of saying that Essentially, women were using punishment to change their partner's personalities. And conscientiousness is a major personality characteristic that you would want in a husband. Conscientiousness means that he's going to do things that he said he was going to do. He's going to feel bad when he didn't do the things that he said he was going to do. And he's also going to be attentive to your needs. Those are all conscientiousness things. And so even though it's unclear how much environment can change personality, it is interesting that there's actually not more studies about how much wives and husbands can change one another's personalities. So in this study, they actually found that women were changing men's personalities, their, their husbands' personalities, more than vice versa, and that men's forgiveness had no influence on women's uh, conscientiousness. Now, this could be a novel, modern thing. You know, it could be that um, men had more control over their wives in the past, and that dynamic has flipped. Or it could be that women are using these more sophisticated methods in order to change personality and that the, the you know, the, the method that a man would have had at his disposal, which is threats, has become morally frowned upon, <laughs> right, to, to, to put it lightly. And so that could be it. I'm, I'm not really sure why, but it does seem that um, women are better at this particular skill in my view, th than men are. And, and the second part of my question was about, so if if that way of influencing doesn't work for men as well as it does for women, what are some of, of the kind of tips you might have for a man in, in that kind of relationship where they also want to, you know, influence their partner for the better? Yeah, so it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, most of the time, men want to influence women to influence them less, if that makes sense. So mostly men's complaints about women in relationships is like, I wish that she would be trying to control me less mm. or that she would be less interested in the minutia of my behavior, yeah. et cetera. Um, whereas women uh, that got more, a strong often, nod from you. <laughs> more often are interested in actually trying to get their partner to be uh, more attentive and interested and responsible, um, things like that, right? And so if, if a man wants to train a woman to train him less, then he has to show her 
that if she engages in positive reinforcement, if she is reinforcing instead of punishing, she's more likely to get what she wants, right? So there's a kind of meta training that can happen. Mm -hmm where if a man engages with a woman, uh, if, 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 a, if a woman is punitive and he just caves immediately, and this is something that I've actually trained Jeffrey to do, I want to be less punitive. Mm. And so it's a little bit like being strapped to the mast, like Odysseus, right? Mm. Where like, I'll be in the middle of a, like, I'll be really angry with him. And I'm like, you better not give me what I want right now because I don't want you to reinforce me for this. This is shitty. Mm. It feels bad. I do not want to, to get what I want mm. in this context. And, you know, similar thing when we first started dating, um, he has was he was dating other women. We we would date other people, and I didn't want him to give in to other women as quickly either. That's an interesting thing mm -hmm. about polyamory. So I was like, um, "Can you empty out this drawer?" It was like midnight. It's like, "Can you empty out this drawer for me?" And he's like, "Okay." It's like, "No, this is an unrealistic expectation. <laughs> this is an irrational demand. Yeah. You will not empty this drawer at midnight. It doesn't make any sense." He's like, "Okay, that's fine." So basically, I've tried to train my partners to get me to be less punitive and more reinforcing, and also just less interested in, in minutia. Um, I had this boyfriend who always would joke around, like, I'd be like, oh, you didn't empty out the dishwasher. Do you even love me? You didn't, you know, uh, lock the door. Do you even love me? And the idea there is that women are using these subtle signals of whether or not you remember to do minute things as signals of responsibility and care mm -hmm. and attention. And oftentimes people can just become uh, forgetful. And so it doesn't really make sense. Um, I'll just give one last example is that, uh, you know, Jeffrey is quite forgetful sometimes, especially about stuff that happened in, you know, when we went on holiday together mm -hmm. or social events that we went to together. And it doesn't help at all. My, my first in instinct, if he doesn't remember something, is to act shitty. <laughs> and like, that's not gonna help him remember anything. Yeah. And I have developed tactics actually to help him remember things better, but I have to read about them. Well, th this is a great thing about, it comes very much back to your question earlier, which is about manipulation versus persuasion or influence or whatever. Mm. What you're really talking about, what I hear in that, is an evolved relationship, where you're trying to take control of the shitty parts of your brain, yeah. as we all ought to and manage them better so you become a better partner to your partner. Yeah. And I think that's a very healthy thing. And I think we can get caught up too much in this idea that the, we're all evil running around trying to manipulate people in this yeah. conniving evil way. Actually, I think if you, if you want to have a better, healthier relationship, what you're talking about is pretty much the only way to get there, actually. Yeah. Um, I and on that note, um, we need to wrap up because I'm hungry and I'm going to start <laughs> smashing shit up. Fantastic. Well, in that case, we've got one final question for you, uh, as and, always. And as always, uh, the last question is, what's the one thing that we're not talking about as a society that we really should be talking about? I, I think I've been talking about it before. <laughs> yeah, I think that this our incline, inclination to manipulate other people about how that it isn't necessarily bad and about how a cynical view of our own evolved psychology is actually the best way forward in order to treat each other better and have better relationships. Well, fantastic, Dana. Thanks for coming on the show, uh, coming again on the show. Uh, when is the book out? The book has not got an out date. So, it's not yeah. got an out date, but we'll we'll be plugging it once it comes yeah. out. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, follow Diana Fleischman. Remind us your Twitter. My my Twitter handle is at sentientist. S e n t i e n t i s t. And you also now have a YouTube account. I've noticed. I have a YouTube account. I've only put a couple things up. More things will come up. I also have a blog called Dianaverse. Mm. Mm. That's the only thing that could capture all of the weird shit I'm into. So, <laughs> it's Dianaverse, yeah. Well, we'll put all the, all those links in the description. Thanks very much for tuning in this week, and we'll see you in a week's time with another brilliant episode. Take care. See you next week, guys. Thanks for watching, guys. As always, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Click the bell button next to the subscribe button so you get notified when a video comes out. And follow us on all the social media at TriggerPod. And also, leave us a nice review on iTunes and spread the word.